This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Tuesday, February 23rd. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VU headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the attack in the Democratic Republic of Congo on Monday that killed Italian ambassador to the country, his bodyguard, and a driver from the World Food Program. In a written statement, the United Nations spokesman, Stefan Dujeric, said, quote, Secretary General strongly condemns today's attack against a joint field mission of the World Food Program in Kibomba near Goma, North Kivu, by unidentified armed elements. Italian flags flew at half-mast in Rome on Tuesday as a mark of respect following the deaths of Ambassador Luca Atanasio, his bodyguard Vittorio Iacovacci, who also died in the attack along with driver Mustafa Milambo. Foreign Minister Luigi Di Maio left an EU meeting early to return to Italy to deal with the situation he has said he will address Parliament about the attack. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack, although Congo's Interior Ministry blamed a Hutu militia called the Democratic Forces for the liberation of Rwanda. A flight carrying the 11,000 vaccine doses against the Ebola virus arrived in Guinea's capital Conakry on Monday after it was delayed for a day by bad weather. They had been due to land on Sunday from Europe but the plane was unable to land because of heavy dust brought by winds from the Sahara Desert. The start of inoculations in the Nzerekore region, where an outbreak of the deadly virus was declared last weekend, is now expected on Tuesday, according to the National Agency of Health Safety. Guinea has recorded four confirmed and four probable cases, including five deaths in the first resurgence of Ebola since the 2013-2016 outbreak. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the hemorrhagic Ebola virus has killed at least four people during a new outbreak. The 10th epidemic was declared on August 1st, 2018 and ended in June last year with more than 2,200 deaths recorded and over 3,400 cases. It was by far the country's largest ever Ebola outbreak. A 12th epidemic was declared earlier this month after a recent flare-up that ended in November after claiming uh, many lives in northwestern province of Equatorial. For more on the Ebola outbreak, Africa 54, Lino Mudu spoke with renowned Congolese microbiologist, Dr. Jean-Jacques Muyembe, who discovered Ebola viral disease in 1976. Dr. Muyembe is the general director of DRC's National Institute of Biomedical Research and coordinates the response of the Ebola and COVID-19 epidemics in his country. Well, the, situation, um, the situation is, of course, worrisome, and it happened in the Vienna Health Zone and in the Katwa Health Zone, uh, town of Butembo. So, in North Kivu. So we just did the sequencing at the National Institute of Biomedical Research in Kinshasa. And the sequencing shows that this epidemic is a continuation of the 2018-2020 epidemic. And so this lady was infected either by her husband, but the concern is that her husband is still negative. But we have ruled out that the infection comes from wildlife. So it doesn't have a connection. But the woman's virus does have some connections with the virus that circulated during the 2018-2020 epidemic. And we are really sure of that. What were the points to remember from the experiences of the past two years in Ituri and North Kivu? First of all, it was an epidemic that happened in a conflict zone and then security was really the biggest challenge. Also, the fact that the epidemics were the focal point were scattered and therefore control was difficult. 
contact tracing was difficult, and also at the end of the epidemic, what we saw that we had never seen before with other epidemics was the number of survivors who still carried the virus. So people were cured but still had the potential to transmit the virus to their partners. It was really something that we haven't seen before. Of course, the positive aspect is that we tested two new vaccines, which were found to be effective. And also, we tested five molecules, two of which showed efficacy. What is your biggest concern about this resurgence, especially during COVID-19? This is a great concern for us, especially since the COVID and Ebola crisis are occurring on a ground, a ground plagued by permanent conflict and insecurity, also the mistrust of the population. It slows down our momentum. It slows down and our ability to quickly overcome this epidemic. And I think the province, the provincial governor, the provincial health ministers, all the health teams are on site to conduct investigations to better understand how this epidemic is unfolding on the ground. Dr. Miyembe, it's been almost 45 years since Ebola was discovered. And as a matter of fact, you are the one who discovered the virus. Today, are there some factors that are still unknown to you? Yes, I think there are still factors that are unknown. Yes, I think there are still factors that are unknown. The biggest factor, the scientific enigma in our century here, will be the reservoir. Which animal, which insect carries the virus? That is really the question mark, and we are still, my team and I, trying to find out more and uncover this mystery by analyzing bats, etc. And also, as we see latest cases, which are causing a lot of reactions. How this epidemic has remained silent for over six months is a question mark. And now there is a resurgence, and these resurgences also leave us, the scientific community, with many questions. How is the experience of the fight against Ebola used to face COVID-19 presently? For us, we are used to epidemics and to organize teams and organize communication and to have dialogue with the population. I believe that this is an asset that allows us to manage the epidemic well. In America, you have seen the number of cases and you have the number of deaths. It's sad. But here, we can say that the epidemic is well managed and finally under control. When you are dealing with COVID-19 and an Ebola outbreak, what are the priorities? COVID is going to live with us a little longer, but Ebola must quickly be contained. As I told you, we have the tools. We have the tools to vaccinate and to treat the sick. Thus, we break the chain of transmission and the virus can go back into the forest into the bush. Then we will be able to deal much more seriously with COVID-19. So the priority is first Ebola and then COVID. In the next installment of Africa 54's Lino Mudu's interview with Dr. Jean-Jacques Muyembe, General Director of DRC's National Institute of Biomedical Research, he will discuss, among other things, the importance of community engagement in the fight against Ebola and some key aspects of his battle against the viral disease over the years. Niger's ruling party candidate Mohamed Bazoum strengthened a lead over his challenger on Tuesday as vote counting continued in the West African nation's presidential runoff, according to Electoral Commission data. Provisional results showed former Interior Minister Bazoum ahead of his challenger the runoff vote meant to usher in Niger's first transition of power from one democratically elected leader to another was held on Sunday after neither candidate secured a majority in the first round in December. Ugandan opposition leader Bobby Wine said on Monday he was dropping his Supreme Court challenge to January's election results. Adam Reid has more. Opposition leader Bobby Wine said on Monday that he is withdrawing a court case challenging Uganda's presidential election results, as he accused the Supreme Court justices hearing the case of bias. We are fighting for freedom. Wine, 
has rejected the outcome of the January election, in which the Electoral Commission said President Yoweri Museveni won 59% to Wine's 35%. Wine was asking the court to overturn the results on several grounds, including the widespread use of violence. In the run-up to the vote, security forces routinely broke up the pop star and politicians' rallies using tear gas, beatings and detentions. The United States and an African election monitoring group both complained of election irregularities, though President Yoweri Museveni claimed it may turn out to be the most cheating free in Uganda's history. On Monday, Wine told a news conference in the capital Kampala that the courts are not independent and it is clear these people are working for Mr Museveni. Solomon Mujita, a judiciary spokesman, told Reuters they will only respond to Wine's accusations and withdraw the decision when he has formally quit the case through his lawyers. That was Adam Reid of Reuters with that report. A standoff over a cabinet reshuffle in Tunisia has accelerated a power struggle between the president, prime minister and parliament speaker that threatens to spill over into street protests by rival blocs and bring down the government. According to Reuters news agency, the dispute has been building since a 2019 election, delivered a fragmented parliament and a political outsider as president, creating a constant state of political turmoil in the only country to emerge with an intact democracy from the Arab Spring revolt a decade ago. It has come to a head as Tunisia attempts to navigate the economic havoc wrought by COVID-19 while facing the biggest protests for years and public debt levels that have spooked capital markets needed to finance the state budget. Tens of thousands of youngsters have been orphaned by Boko Haram militant attacks in northern Nigeria. Child advocates say some of those children are finding a home and support at a school in Sokoto State, as the U.S. Haruna Shehu learned in a recent visit. It is Monday morning in Nigeria's northwestern state of Sokoto. 13-year-old Hawakari and younger brother Muhammad are getting ready for classes at UK Jarma Academy. They and roughly 160 other youths, mostly from northeastern Borno and Yobe states, but also from Sokoto, were brought here for support after Boko Haram insurgents killed their parents. The students range in age from 6 to 15. Good morning, how are you? Most were very young when their parents died. Some retain vivid memories of violence. So, my father was with my stepmother having his meal when someone called him to come outside. Gunmen hit him with bullets. He was taken to my mother. He looked at me and later died. My mother died days later of shock. Ibrahim Ismail came from Meiduguri, Bruno State capital. He had witnessed his father's murder. We were heading home from the market. Some passed-by warned us to go back because Boko Haram militants were attacking the community. But the Boko Haram cut and beheaded my dad. And I started crying. When I grow up, I want to be a soldier to avenge my father's death. Since emerging in 2009, the Boko Haram insurgency has opened tens of thousands of children in northern Nigeria, Borno State officials say. Youth Empowerment Initiative in that state says the Islamist extremist group has harmed these children in other ways too. They were used either as, either as um, soldiers and then informants, and they are the ones that it's where Boko Haram used them, which is against the United Nations uh, uh, principle. Without strong social supports, the children must fend for themselves, Yunana adds. Most of them you see them walking around the street begging, and this is not a very good omen to the society itself. When Hawa and Muhammad lost their parents in 2015, their grandmother in Meiduguri was named guardian. 
that she couldn't afford to educate them. To aid desperate children like them, businessman and philanthropist Omarun Kobo opened Jarma Academy in 2018. They were not receiving the care they need. And because I have the means to assist, I decided to contribute. I am aware of the reward God gives for helping orphans. The academy provides food, shelter, clothing and health care along with religious schooling and the academic classes that follow Nigeria's national education curriculum. Jarama Academy, which gets some aid from individuals, groups and governments, initially aimed to support the youth through secondary school. Now, Kobo has committed to covering their university cost using proceeds from a real estate holding. We are making plans for their better future, as we are doing for our own children. For Hawa and Muhammad, Jarma Academy is not just a school. This place has become our home, our school forever. I am very happy. I am receiving both Western and religious education here. The director is showing us unimaginable love and care. They slaughter cows for us every month. But thousands of other orphans live on the streets in northern Nigeria. Kobo said he hopes the academy will serve as a model, inspiring others to help them. Harune Shehu, VOA News, Sokoto, Nigeria. We would like to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on BOAAfrica.com. Coming up, a Kenyan startup transforms locusts into animal feed and organic fertilizer. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. Kenya is battling some of the worst locust plagues in decades, but startup The Bug Picture hopes to transform the pests into profits and bring hope to the hopeless whose crops and livelihoods are being destroyed by the insects. Francesca Lena reports. Kenya is battling some of the worst locust plagues in decades. They've been devouring crops and other vegetation, ruining livelihoods of local farmers. But one startup called The Bug Pitcher is working to bring hope by harvesting the locusts and turning them into animal feed and organic fertilizer. The idea sounds simple enough. The locusts are first harvested, then crushed, dried and milled into powder, which is then turned into protein rich animal feed. The insects are collected at night by torchlight when they are resting on shrubs and trees. Harvesting during the day is out of the question. Albert Lemasulani is a field coordinator working for the bug pitcher. Biological behavior of locust is that they start roosting in the evening from 6.30 and uh, up, to, up to 8 in the following day, 8, 9. So where we normally like to have them try to start having as early as 5.30 because they are, they are sleeping, they are weak, they can't move, they can just be picked or they can shake the trees and collect. It's easier for them to collect. You can't collect locusts during the midday because they keep on flying. Abdi Apchagai is programs officer at NGO Sapcone. 
We are doing the crushing of the locust after collecting them from the community, local communities last night. And after crushing them, now they'll be dried. After drying now, they'll be taken for milling. Milling now is when now it will be processed into powder and now it will be packed. Then the formulation now starts from there, where the, desert, the, the locust powder is being added other components to form animal feed and organic fertilizer for farms. Swarms of between 40 and 80 million locusts per square kilometre can travel up to 93 miles per day. But the insects are also protein rich, which makes them ideal for animal feed. Locusts apparently have like 70% of protein, so it substitutes the biggest protein, the most expensive part of animal feed is the protein. The Bug Project partners with local farmers to harvest the locusts. Locals receive 50 shillings or 46 US cents for every two pounds collected. Between February 1st and February 18th, 2021, the project oversaw the harvest of 1.3 tons of locusts. Another way of controlling them is spraying locusts with pesticides before they can fly. But the chemicals can damage other insects and the environment. The bug pitcher is targeting swarms of five hectares or less in inhabited areas not suitable for spraying. But while the project offers a more sustainable approach to help farmers fight back against the locusts, the root of the problem is climate change. Scientists say warmer seas are creating more rain, waking dormant eggs. Cyclones that disperse the swarms are also getting stronger and more frequent. That was Francesca Lina of Reuters reporting. U.S. Attorney General nominee Judge Merrick Gollard told lawmakers Monday an investigation into the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol will be his first priority if confirmed. VOA's congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson has more on President Joe Biden's peak to be the nation's top law enforcement officer. A challenge of unprecedented scope. <laughs> The nominee for the nation's top law enforcement job vowing a broad investigation into the underlying causes of the January 6th riot. I think this was the most uh, heinous attack on, a on the democratic processes that I've ever seen and one that I never expected to see in my lifetime. The Department of Justice is already prosecuting hundreds for their role in the riot. Garland was asked if he would consider a broader definition of people to prosecute. A definition that could potentially include former President Trump. That uh, you will not rule out investigation of funders, organizers, ringleaders, or aiders and abettors who were not present in the Capitol on January 6th. We begin with the people on the ground and we work our way up to those uh, uh, who are involved and further involved. And uh, we will pursue these leads uh, wherever uh, they take us. Uh, that's Thank you. the job of a prosecution. An experienced U.S. judge, Garland was nominated in 2016 by then-President Barack Obama to fill a vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. Senate Republicans held up his nomination, citing the upcoming 2016 presidential election. Now Garland is poised to take over for Trump's attorneys general, who drew Democrats' anger for the way they handled that post. Under Attorney General Sessions and his successor, Bill Barr, the Justice Department literally became an arm of the White House, committed to advancing the interest of President Trump, his family, and his political allies. But Republicans have also argued that was a problem under the Obama administration as well. The Department of Justice was politicized and weaponized in a way that was directly contrary to over a century of tradition of the Department of Justice of being apolitical and not a partisan tool to target your opponents. Garland told senators he does not view the job as a political position. I am not the president's lawyer. Um, I am uh, um, the United States lawyer, and I will do everything in my power, uh, uh, which I believe is considerable, uh, to fend off any effort by anyone um, uh, to make prosecutions or investigations uh, partisan uh, or political in any way. The Senate is likely to confirm Garland by early next week. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington.
British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced plans Monday to begin easing coronavirus lockdown measures. Johnson credited Britain's rapid vaccination program for allowing the country to begin reopening amid growing scientific evidence that the vaccines will help to bring the global pandemic under control. Henry Rito reports from London. Britain is under one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. Government scientists say the measures are working, with coronavirus infections and deaths in decline. So Boris Johnson announced Monday it's soon time to start opening up. Two weeks from today, pupils and students in all schools and further education settings can safely return to face-to-face -face teaching. From the 8th of March, people will also be able to meet one person from outside their household for outdoor recreations. Johnson announced a plan to reopen the economy and society step by step over several months, based, in his words, on data, not dates. Non-essential services and shops will stay shut until at least April. We're setting out on what I hope and believe is a one-way road to freedom. Londoners gave a broad welcome to the announcement. I do trust them this time round. I think there's been lessons learned. It would be great to get out of it as soon as possible, but careful step. While the lockdown measures have brought down infections, scientists say there is also early evidence that Britain's vaccination programme is starting to have an effect. Initial results suggest both the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines are highly effective in preventing hospitalisation through COVID-19. Scientists have described the results as spectacular. Getting over 80% protection from severe diseases, very impressive. The, the best that we get usually from the annual flu jab is 60%. The AstraZeneca drug is a key pillar of Britain's vaccination programme. But some European states have cast doubt on its effectiveness, with France, Germany and South Korea among countries recommending against giving the vaccine to the over 65s. So I think there's no reason now for other countries in Europe and beyond to be in any way concerned about the effectiveness of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine in the elderly population. However, early data suggests the AstraZeneca jab may not be as effective against the South Africa variant of the coronavirus in preventing mild to moderate disease, but it may still prevent severe cases. There was further encouraging data Monday from Israel, which has given a first vaccine dose to half its population. Research suggests the Pfizer vaccine not only prevents illness, but also stops transmission of the virus, seen as key in bringing the pandemic under control. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.